Brother, what's going on, bro? Hey, maintaining it, brother. Man, it's good to see you too, man. <laughs> Likewise, brother. Yeah, yeah, Likewise, I know, man. And uh, I know a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people in the world kind of know about you now through, through the situation, man. Mm -hmm. You want to uh, introduce yourself to the people that don't know you or haven't heard of you? you know what I'm well, uh, my name is Rakim Balagoon. Uh, I'm a part of an organization called Gorilla Mainframe. I serve as uh, Chief of Command. Um, also, I'm a founder of the European Union Gun Club and another organization called Geronimo Tactical. Um, you know, recently I've been um, labeled as a uh, terrorist uh, based off uh, my political ideology and um, and the work I've put out in the community, you know, over the last about four or five years. Yeah, and they was trying to call you a, a black extremist, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. you know what uh, why, why do you think they was trying to call you a, a black extremist? Whatever, we still don't even know the definition of that. <laughs> you the first to ever be labeled well, that. <laughs> well, the thing, you know, the thing is, you know, we have a history of the United States government label numerous people a threat who pretty much have done nothing but, you know, provide resources, programs, and help to the community. So, um, this is something that has been historical within the COINTELPRO. And even prior to that, um, the United States federal government has a history and is known for its um, overreach when it comes to uh, pursuing this uh, dominance right. amongst the people. Right. That's a great way to put in that overreach. Mm -hmm. So pretty much with the, what you do is go out and pretty much help feed and train mm -hmm. things of that nature. They look at that as a, a threat. I remember uh, in the beginning, um, when we all first started the Gorilla Mainframe, we was in South Dallas training, and uh, I remember the police came out and uh, was trying to move everybody around and stuff because of what we bring to the community, things of that nature. Uh, right. why, why you feel as though they uh, didn't, didn't, didn't want Gorilla Mainframe in that area? trying to reach out to the people, even cleaning, cleaning up the community as far as like picking up trash and everything. The police, you know, their biggest fear is seeing the people that they rule and dominate and abuse uh, become organized mm -hmm. because once the people become organized, they can be able to overpower and overwhelm the police. Mm -hmm. And they know that. And so um, the thing is, the people don't know that. And so what Grilla Mainframe tried to do is we try to go out there and develop a relationship with the community to uh, meet their needs with different programs. You know, uh, no matter if it's, you know, providing food or it's maybe providing fitness. But whatever program that that community is able to take advantage of, it's a way to where we can develop with the community and try to help it get organized by, you know, um, direct relationships. You know, and the police, they definitely understand, you know, that concept. And, you know, so if they see anything that's not government related, because if it's government related, you're going to get permits, you're going to get 50C3s, you're going to then you're going to hire police mm -hmm. to escort you, secure you, but really they're escorting you mm -hmm. um, for your event, mm -hmm. you know, oversee and overwatch. You know, with us, we're a grassroots movement. Right. You know, we for the people, by the people, you know, and so um, we, we do not have no influence by, you know, local government, state government, or federal government. And our agenda is strictly based off working class people, um, right? And uh, 
in their wills to be free. Right? And, you know, the police, they don't want us to be free. They want to be able to have the ability and their power to, um, to make, keep us detained and to keep us powerless. Right. So, you know, that's why I they didn't want us out there. You know, South Dallas, we already know historically, you know, South Dallas um, is a historical black community. My family is from South Dallas. You know, they're from Bunton and um, Turner Courts. You know, um, I, I, you know I, I grew up off of uh, Oakland, uh, which is now Malcolm X. In uh, Pine Street, you know. So uh, historically, you know, South Dallas has been a black independent community, and late, you know, for within the last ten years, there's been an aggressive effort to gentrify South Dallas, mm -hmm. and so you know they want to move black people out the community, especially particularly around the Fair Park area. Mm -hmm. You know, you and see that you see the change in that, oh, yeah. especially when the fur hits. You see how, how uh, you see you even see how how the blacks out there cater to the whites out there when the fur part hit. Like this year was the first time I ever. I just actually see how they actually stop and block off everything just to cater to the Texas OU guy. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. so, well, he, he right purpose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's crazy, but you're not gonna really get that. When, when a black person, when black people try to host an event out there, they're not going to get that same treatment like that. Right. Yes, sir. You know that. Now, we were talking about that about South Dallas earlier. Um, when I was a person up for us, uh, how, how the South did it for us, like even Rochester and the Carlisle, how things just changed from back 90s, early 2000s to now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm how, how much it changed. Yeah, you know, um, it's going to constantly keep changing aggressively, uh, particularly around the Fair Park area. Uh, I know um, somebody said that they was talk talking about building a whole pool in Fair Parks. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, when you got businesses like that talking about coming to the community, you know it's going to be some heavy uh, gentrification. And, um, uh, we were speaking that because you remember, you know, the bridge mm -hmm. that, that cross uh, connects South Dallas and Oak Hill together. And we was riding, we was getting some flips, and we was seeing the, the uh, what's the arcs? Those arcs, yeah. Right. Transit, transit arcs. Right. Yeah. And he was saying that was the sign of gentrification. When he spoke, when he spoke that, it just made me think when he was speaking, saying that just then. You know, when you see those arcs in places like this, the sign of gentrification, or oh, there's going to start start being. And then we went and spoke to um, a guy that our business owner a guy that owned that, that gas station out there, that Valero out there. Mm -hmm. He'd been up for years. And he was saying, uh, he, he was going to get up, but he was thinking, he was saying that the stores, that whole strip right there is going to be knocked down because they're going to put a freeway through there. Okay. Yeah, and, they kinda, and then it goes back to the gentrification. It's like, well, since we, 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 we ask y'all to move, y'all not going to move, so we're going to have to force you to Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they, you know they, you know they, they've been doing this for a long time, and you know they're gonna always do it. You know, gentrification is never gonna stop. It's not gonna be like, but well, we got South Dallas, we got certain areas of Oak Cliff, we got certain areas of North Dallas and West Dallas, mm -hmm. and, uh, East Dallas. Now we're gonna chill, and this is how things gonna be. No, it's gonna always constantly. Yeah. Be gentrified. I'm just um, dislocating people, relocating people. That's breaking up community. That's breaking up, um, you know, relationship. That's breaking up uh, a legacy. Right. Right. You know? And now, you know, we live in communities these days that it's not really a community. It's just people that live next to each other. They don't know each other. They don't know nothing about each other. And that's where we come from. But, you know, I think about the 90s. You know, everybody knew each other in the, in the apartments. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's one of the questions, man. You talk about the culture of Dallas. like one of the reasons of the documentary, we're building the culture. Because of, 
back in the 90s and like you're saying, it was more unity. It was more things happening. Right. Now you look at it and people always talk about how Dallas is the most hateful city now. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people not sure where that came from and how it changed. Uh, I know from your experience, what do, what do you think kind of altered that? I don't think Dallas is a hateful city. Uh, I think the pigs and the courts are hateful. Mm-hmm. But the people, you know, the people I know here are good people. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about, you know, getting the shirt off their back. Right. You know, I, I've seen them, you know, operate in certain situations. You right. know, they'll go further than you ever thought they would uh, go and stay longer than you ever thought they would stay. And so, you know, I think that that's the youth. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a youth, but this, this youth movement is not just in Dallas. Yeah. It's evidently in Chicago. It's evidently in Detroit, right. in Baltimore, right. in LA, so many other cities, you know. You're saying, you're and, saying Atlanta getting like Chicago now. Yeah, yeah, all, everywhere. Even in Mississippi, in a small town mm-hmm. that nobody hear about, there's a lot of things going on. And what what is a great example of is, you know, the cultural engineering that has been done to our people by pop culture and hip hop and and other uh, media vices, right. you know, and, you know, just to start, right. and, and what it influenced our kids into, you know, um, you know, like things of substance you know, that we would have valued at their age, mm-hmm. they, you know, they don't. Right. But at the same time, you know, I see things where they are better than our generation too, mm-hmm. for, um, you know, the way they have developed. So, you know, it's definitely a change. You know, I, I look at my sons, uh, my godson, he's 16. You know, I look at his culture and his age and how their schools were versus the schools we went to DISD in the 90s, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, it's definitely a big change. And that's, that's another question, too, man. The schools, like, even schools back then, like, you look at the school, the school system now and how it is and how it's being ran to today, especially DISD, you look at, like, I asked my daughters, like, what do you see when they look at the TV and all that? Looking at this school, I said, "What is it different? What what's different than your school that you see the school the other kids go to?" And they talk about the ceilings, the walls, how the bathrooms, how it just you know they wish they had the privilege that the other kids had. You know what I'm saying? Right. And right. You t- even with the teachers, like you know what I'm saying, you look at the, the teachers, and you know a lot of people they spoke they speak on that. They speak on you know you got kids teaching kids now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, just even when you think about just the culture of kids going outside and playing, mm-hmm. you know, I think mm-hmm. about South Dallas in the nineties. That park that we was at in South Dallas, mm-hmm. back in the nineties, that park would have been filled mm-hmm. with kids, teenagers, mm-hmm. you know, adults, things of that nature. You know, um, now it was a, it's just a few people out. You know, um, a lot of kids are, are based, you know, a lot of their socialization, social socializing is, is happening on through devices. You know, going live. You know, um, you know, you can talk on the phone, and watch TV all on the same device. And so, you know, our, our kids are, are captivated. But think about who owns and controls those devices. Mm-hmm. Who owns control what comes on those devices. Who owns control of YouTube, you know? And the things that, that gets their attention, that channels them, you know, it puts their attention on things that really doesn't matter. Like the uh, new freezer challenge, you know that's what they're concerned about. What's the latest dance, mm-hmm. you know, um, versus 
you know, being concerned about things that's actually going on in our community and things like that. And, and two, also social media have made the world a lot smaller. So they're not concerned about their community anymore. They're concerned about, you know, uh, this such and such Instagram model that's in Boston. You, know, you say a lot smaller, a lot less aware of the reality. Uh, pretty much, you know, it. They're distracted, mm-hmm. if, if anything. Uh, and so you have a few kids that kind of make it into the conscious whim at a young age, do either through their parents or sometimes on their own. Right. You know, uh, I know my son, he has a, a, a classmate that he went to school with that was uh, a big fan of Sarah Said, Sarah Sudden Said. Right. And so, and this girl is, you know, 15, mm-hmm. you know, uh, impressed by Sarah Sudden Said in his videos and it opened her up to, you know, other. You know, online scholars and videos and things of that nature. Right. So that phenomenon that. does happen. Yeah, because I was uh, I heard a few young people speak on uh, on Sue said was kind of Sue said and Brother Ben and things that kind of enlightened me. I was like, oh, there's some youth that I heard that's still catching on and they very intrigued by it. and they they eager to learn more. You know what I'm saying? And uh, speaking of Brother Ben, I know he, he he did an interview with you, and I missed the video. When he, when he did the interview, which I know it, it brought awareness and it brought more awareness to your situation and stuff. How was your experience with Brother Ben You know, Brother Ben Ness is a, um, a real cool brother. You know, he's very interesting. You know, he's very um, humble, chill, laid back, relaxed, you know, easy going. You know, he has a pretty good um, energy. And he's young, young too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I like the brother. He's young. Yeah, you can. It's like he's young, but but you can tell just from his energy that you know his mentality is not his. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? That he's a little bit advanced. Yeah. You know, and and that's why I sense just being around him for that short period of time. How how do you reach out to you? Um, you know, through some comrades from um, Dallas Weekly. Um, you know, the Conrad through Dallas Weekly, um, that's, um, and that's this right here. Right? Mm-hmm. So you can see. Yeah, with the Dallas Weekly. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was Brother Jihad from yeah. Dallas Weekly had uh, reached out to me. And, uh, and, you know, of course, through Conrad Yafeo. You mm-hmm. know, Yafeo, he. You know, he comes from a nation of Islam, family, and culture. So they have a, a, a long relationship with him. So, you know, they reached out to Yafeo, and, you know, Yafeo reached out to me, and, uh, you know, we just made it happen. You know? uh, and, you know, it, it, it was cool. It was, you know, it was a great conversation. And, uh, you know, I look forward to maybe. I know, I know, man. It was a big movement on social media, especially Facebook. You know, especially Facebook is for your situation. I know a lot of people was hearing me because they know, man, you close, you know, like brothers for real. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, man, what's going on? What's going on with them? I wouldn't give them too much detail. You know, some people just want to be dogs. Just, yeah, yeah that's all good. <laughs> and then, uh, but no, uh, when they were talking to you coming home, and I was like, I already knew it. You know what I'm saying? I was right. like, cool. I was right. waiting to touch back down. Right. And uh, I know your situation, man. You you want to shine a light on how you how you think they might have uh, how they was following you and stuff like that. How you think they might have? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it's like this. Uh, I pretty much found out that I was on you know the watch list when I was in court. You know uh, the way. It works in the feds when they bust you, mm-hmm. you know, like they immediately take you downtown yeah. and haul you in the courtroom. 
It's like, <laughs> it's like we want that nigga. Okay, yeah. let's how get bring him here to me now. Yeah. Huh? You know, you know, you go into the courtroom, and then you know you kind of. But what you're dealing with is, you know, telling you your charges. But what your initial interaction with that courtroom is a bond hearing. Now, a bond hearing is a hearing where in the federal courts, a federal judge, a magistrate judge, um, listen to your either attorney, a public pretender that they give you at that moment, mm -hmm. just out of nowhere, mm -hmm. and, um, and they decide should you be released, and if you should be released, how much money or if any money at all and if you're not why not and the two main reasons would be your threat to society mm -hmm. or your flight risk that's it yeah yeah those are two reasons and so now keep in mind you know 5 a.m is 5 a.m december 12, 2017 is when they, you know, rammed my door. You know, before that, I didn't know that, you know, I was going. So, I, there's no way I could obtain a lawyer right. to represent me Five that fast. Right. <laughs> right. You know, and, and I have not made no fucking phone calls. You know what I'm saying? But I got an attorney here, and I haven't even been offered no phone calls to call to say, hey, I'm locked up, y'all, or can I get an attorney? But well, y'all give me an attorney, okay? And so, um, in the midst of this hearing, um, they was, you know, the prosecutor, um, United States attorney, um, pretty much was saying, hey, we, sh we cannot let this guy go, you know. And the reason why we can't let him go, he's on the terrorist watch list. Um, you know, he's he had he, he on social media. He had not he had empath he, he had empathized with cop killers, and he's following all the law that he's supposed to follow for <laughs> the way he interacts with the community, and we don't like that. <laughs> for, you know, so, you know, and he had a firearm out in the bow next, on the uh, nightstand next to his bedroom, up uh, next to his bed, and uh, a rifle under his bed while a teenager was in another room. <laughs> that's, that's, what? So he's definitely a threat to society, <laughs> Your Honor, and we must detain him. You got a whole gun show in your house, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so Your Honor said, you know what? You got damn right. But we watch TV every day, and these, they got them all on the fire. <laughs> the Everybody in the, in the trunk. You know what I mean? What the fuck, Sean? I mean, come on, man. Yeah, so that's how I found out. And yeah. so also Aaron, um, uh, I'm sorry, Special Agent um, Aaron Cayley, that was the agent who had been following me and still following me. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. You know, um, he also, you know, took the stand that he was at the hearing. And so when they questioned him, it was, you know, it was like, you know, so what surveillance have you done? Things that nature. He was like, well, you know, followed him to work. You know, followed him to the grocery store. You know, things like that. You know, so pretty much followed me to work. You know, followed me to go pick up some diapers. And probably was curious about why the hell I was getting diapers. You know, it, you know, the thing about it was the two years that this dude has been surveilling to me. Two, two years. years. Yeah, yeah. It's about three years now. Yeah. yeah, but two. At that time, it was about two. It's two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
What ultimately did they think you was a threat to? Well, them actually. <laughs> well, this is how it works. I don't need to be in this room because I'm mad at the motherfucker right now. Well, I'm glad you asked that because I never really just went this detail with nobody. Right. You know what I'm saying? But it's like this, you know. Since this shit happened, you know, I've been studying the FBI a lot. You know, the history of the FBI. Yeah, even prior to him, just when it was the, uh, before it was the Bureau. Before the FBI, yeah. yeah. The Justice Department. Right. Um, the investigations, you know. Uh, you know, and what I've learned is that right now, they have about a million people. A lot of people are being watched. I wouldn't be surprised just, if I was on there myself. But di- different people are just being watched yeah. on different levels. Right, exactly. There's, you know, some people are just being watched. They're just, their names are just in this database and that's it. Mm-hmm. A potential threats mm-hmm. and things. That, and some people are actually being watched. And some people are being watched more than others. And so, you know... The thing is, I didn't know I was being watched, you know, and two, I wasn't concerned about being watched because I wasn't doing nothing illegal. I don't live a legal lifestyle. I just go to work, you know, come home, help my kids with their homework on the weekends, get them to their basketball games. Are your organizations were within the law? All your organization that you did was well within the law. Most definitely. Most definitely. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, so that's how, you know, that's how I found out that, you know, the gist of the detail is based off, you know, the, the special agent, Aaron Keegley, uh, the Dallas FBI. Branch, you know, testify, you know, and, you know, through, because the thing about it is this, the FBI don't have to give you no information, Mm -hmm. but under oath in the courtroom, being cross-examined, especially a question that's considered with the case, then they have to answer Mm -hmm. by clarity. So that was the only reason that I was able to get that information. Mm. You know, if he would have never been, you know, cross-examined or anything of that nature, I would have never got it. And I actually had a small conversation with the dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, when he arrested me. You know, and I heard all this shit in court. We were walking out. I was like, so, I'm a terrorist? So that's, that's... So what makes you so what makes me a terrorist? He was like, well, you you know, you know, you know that white man bullshit. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. You yeah, know, you know, right well, there's, there's some things, you know, it, it looks right, you know, you're you're, you're right out there, you're, you're right there on it, man. And I'm just like, Well, we can have that conversation whenever you want. You know? <laughs> like then you know, then you know, we go separate ways. He goes home. When I go to uh, a cell to be shipped to uh, uh, Mansfield, yeah. mm. you know, and there it was like it's horrible. <laughs> what a living condition! That's like the actual experience uh, in there at that time in uh, Mansfield. How was your experience in the? Oh man, Mansfield is nasty. It, it's raining ghetto. Gross, you got the guards choosing on the inmates and, you know, marrying them. Uh, what? What? And, uh, <laughs> and, and this is like a retaining facility. <laughs> this ain't no place where you do time at. Okay. Yeah. This is where they detain you. There's no so they don't places. feel like you just, yeah, they don't feel like they just, or as, as uh, uh, under under fire as, as you was just at the penitentiary. penitentiary. It's still the same. Like, it's still, yeah. like these niggas, like... <laughs> but, but I'm saying, like, 
the jail was nasty. They didn't have the sanitation of it was horrible. Mold all over the place. You know, they feed you. Man, I, I lost a lot of weight in there. Um, you know, they feed you two warm meals a day. And the final meal is like a bologna sandwich with some pretzels and a cornbread cake. Mm. <laughs> it's like this cornbread, and they put sugar in it, so it makes it a cake. <laughs> God damn, bro. Sugar. I don't think it's real sugar. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that was the experience there, you know. Uh, I was in there with some brothers from South Dallas and West Dallas, you know. Uh, Able to build a little bit? Yeah, yeah, it was cool. We yeah. were working out, you know, doing, you know, uh, you know, one brother in there, uh, Mike, you know, uh, you know, cool brother, he, he went to the K, he, he graduated like 2000, uh, 2008. muscle ass all, you know, so we was in there working out. So that helped me deal with the stress yeah. of just being snatched from my reality. Right. Now I mean like I'm you know, I was in the free world, just vegetarian, you know, partially vegetarian, vegan diet, eating fruits and vegetables every day. The snacks are somewhere where we eat nothing but processed food, no fresh fruits and vegetables. You know, away from my kids, you know, my uh, newborn daughter at the time, right. you know, um, also my 11 year old and 15 year old son, you know, so that was under my care. So, you know, the thing really, you know, and not only with that, but the same day I was evicted from my apartment because, you know, I was living in Addison. I had, within my lease, I had a certain type of lease that, you know, anything that's, you know, crime related is automatically eviction. Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, yeah, they had that eviction uh, notice on my door before I even, they rolled me off to jail. That's, a, <laughs> that's how fast they moved. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm thinking like, I'm getting evicted and I'm going to jail. And I'm going to be in jail. Don't know when I'm getting out of jail. Mm -hmm. get, get there, find out I'm not getting out. You know what I mean? And man, my shit, it's just. And, and how long they held you in there? I mean, I know how. Um, you know, five months. Five months. Yeah, almost six months. Yeah. And then with Mansfield, I know they shipped you off. Yeah, the Seagullville. Yeah, I went from um, Mansfield to Seagullville. Um, luckily, I was only in Mansfield for about two weeks. Right. And uh, they moved me to Seagullville. Seagullville is like a. The max? No, no. It's actually uh, a low. It's a camp. Okay. And, uh, but I was in a detained unit there at the camp. So we're, you know, we don't even, we're separate. In the right. I was going to say, a lot of people uh, don't understand that when you detain versus, you know, uh, segregation. You know, like that. A lot of people don't know the difference between that. Being detained is the worst time because. You know, when you're doing time, you already been sentenced. You go to somewhere that's designed for long living and it's designed for comfort right. and it reduces the stress. Right. But when you're detained, yeah. that facility is designed for very temporary living. Yeah. And so, you know, like the, the mattresses, the food, the, care for the things they have on commissary, the even like the medical, you, you know, so if you have, like I had a medical problem, but since it wasn't life in a death situation, they said you should not have to deal with it until, um, you know, you get sentenced. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, be, be in there for four or five years before they get sentenced. You know, you sound like Boosie, I remember when Boosie was on his little story, he was talking about that, how, you know, he had diabetes and they didn't want to give him this medicine and stuff like that. How they would do you in our people with these conditions? They try to pretty much let you die naturally mm -hmm. and have an excuse of why you go. You know what I'm saying? It's just crazy how they like that. How was your experience in that? 
Seagullville. Uh, you know, Seagullville was cool. You know, it was you know uh, brothers from you know all over Dallas. You know, I'm a deep town brother. You know, you know, uh, you know a lot of people they know me from the movies, but you know me, you know, prior to yeah, the yeah, this yeah. regular Dallas cat. Yeah. So you know, you know I'm. You know, and there were brothers that's, you know, my age, younger, you know, some older. And, you know, they mainly from Oak Cliff, you know, North Dallas, South Dallas, West Dallas, you know, uh, East Dallas brothers, Pleasant Grove, a lot of Pleasant Grove, a lot of Pleasant Grove brothers up in there. So, you know. Yeah, I know, I remember, uh, I know a couple times, uh, a couple of partners was in there at that time. I know sometimes I know a lot of people link up and click up together in that club. Yeah, 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 man, I, I linked up with, 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 with a couple of cool brothers, you know what I'm saying? And since I've been out, you know, I've been fucking with them, you know what I'm saying? You know, send them some money on their, put money on their books, you know, write them, you know, do a little, run a little errands for them, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. You know, just because, you know, when, when you're on the, you know, one thing about this experience that, you know, I'm grateful to have it because, you know, once, you know, it's been a long time since I've had handcuffs on. It's been a long time since I've been in the jail or anything of that nature. So, um, so having to relive this experience just reminded me, you know, the things that I can do. Right. To help support my loved ones that are locked up and others as well. Right. Because, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they when, once they become locked up, they naturally go through a depression. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they need some connection with the outside world because your life is literally like a dog right. in the backyard. Wake up, eat the same thing, go stand over here, go sit over here, go lay over here, go run over here, mm-hmm. then you eat again. You're just going from meal to meal, then just to go to sleep and wake up and do it all over again. So, as well as, you know, stressing about your case, you know, you don't know what the hell you're looking at. Mm-hmm. And then the thing about it, the thing that fucks a lot of people up is that. Your destiny is, is, mm. is taken away from your fucking hands. Mm-hmm. This is somebody else's hand on their desk, and they deal with it whenever you deal with it. You, 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 your whole life, you're just sitting up in here, yeah. you know, just being stored away while your family constantly bleeds out, while your career constantly bleeds out, mm. you know, just everything. You know, you lose all hope and yeah, and everything about this. Yeah. And, and you know the first thing you see, you know, that is that you know dudes, their girlfriends start leaving them, mm. or they they find out that they homeboys or their family ain't as down as they thought they were. And you know it's just it's typical jail, uh, you know, jailhouse experiences where people go through and so it causes frustration, it causes pain. Brothers don't know how to deal with their pain, so they take the frustration out on others because it's a lot of tension. Everybody walk around with a lot of tension. You know, mm-hmm. everybody got kids, they, they got a girlfriend that they out there concerned with what she doing, where she at. Yeah, you know, after nine o'clock you can't call. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so you know, and then um, and so, you know, while I was in there, my main focus was to produce as much positive energy inside as much as possible. All right. Really kept you going. Well, yeah, it did, but not just. It's also a principle of service, too. Yeah, just natural, because the thing is, is that I didn't. My thing that I was really concerned about was the changing, allow this situation changing mm-hmm. for the worst. Right? Mm-hmm. I didn't want to become institutionalized. 
Mm-hmm. And I know if I don't, either the coach is going to engineer me or I have to engineer it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I, it ain't no way I can just be myself without trying to engineer it and it don't engineer me. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to change it. And so, you know, when I went in there, you know, um, you know, definitely, you know, I, you know, I was very, you know, positive towards, you know, everybody, um, very supportive. You know, I tried to help everybody out as much as possible. And you know, in you know, in jail culture, that's not everybody in MO. That's like the last people in mm-hmm. A lot of people trying to get over, they trying to do this, they trying to do that. It's you know, so much it, it's so you know, so many negative things that a lot of people are up to or that goes through their mind when interacting with others. So I wanted to combat that. And so, you know, I, I, I educated people. You know, one, I got the people attention on just who I am, you know, by uh, them just seeing who I am and what I do. Right. It's one thing, you know, social media, uh, you only see what people allow you to see. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, you don't really see the true person. Right. You just see what they show you, exactly. what they want to show you. And so all the other things they're able to hide. That. When you're in jail, you can't hide that shit. Mm-hmm. They, they with you 24-7. Yeah. So you you talking about you black power, you about that life, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You this, this, and this, and this. They were like, okay, we'll see seven weeks from now. Mm-hmm. Like, still black yeah. power. We'll see seven weeks from now, you're still a vegetarian, and they keep bringing the slop through. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's me eating a lot of it. You know what I'm saying? We gonna see seven weeks from now, you gonna still be able to, or you gonna still work out, mm-hmm. you know, with being stressed with dealing with this case. So, you know, I think people just seeing I am who I say I am, you know, I was able to win a lot of people respect. And then them just watching. Yeah. You know, wake you know, wake I would wake up, I eat breakfast. And then I work out. I work out for an hour and a half, two hours, you know, doing high intensity exercises, you know. And so, the you know, uh, these brothers knew that, these brothers knew that, hey, man, this dude, he's serious about this shit, you know. Also, due to the support of, you know, the black community, um, you know, I had numerous books. Right. There, you know, all, you know, all the, you know, from George Jackson, Blood in My Eye, right. I had Soul of Dad Brother, I had Revolutionary Suicide, by Huey P. Newton, The Die for the People by Huey P. Newton. I had a lot of stuff. Chairman Mayo, Please tell me, Please tell me you had Negroes with Guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they took that. The feds took that. They still got the book right now. Yeah, yeah. They said, we ain't letting that Negro get that gun. Back. <laughs> took his gun in his book. <laughs> and they knew. But you know, that's how I run it. Because the matches behind that, which I'm going to get back to what we were talking about. Um, but the message behind them taking that book is just letting you know that knowledge is a weapon. Mm-hmm. And even mm-hmm. our enemies understand that. Right. You know, that's a they understood that that book was a resource of revolution. Mm-hmm. Yep. Negroes with guns. Yep. And what was Robert doing in that book? Right. You know what I mean? Well, in that book, he was not just randomly running around killing white people or police officers because he was emotionally irrational, mm-hmm. you know. He used the firearm as protection as they dealt with the injustice of the community. Right. That's all he did, mm-hmm. protect families. Yeah. And, and so that book was the perfect example how in the black resistance movement, how firearms should be brandished and handled with dealing with oppression. Yeah. 
until mm-hmm. you have the right to wear a home. Exactly. And so, so that's, you know, I, I feel like I had to touch up on that. But going back to what I was saying, but, you know, so they see me reading the books. Mm-hmm. They, st- they see me still being, you know, even though the food is very scarce, I'm very tight on my diet. Right. You know, and and because one thing I used to tell them, I said, man, I'm not going to change my principles. And I told them that. And when, I, when I came in there, because they were like, I would tell me I'm vegetarian. And, uh, you're a vegetarian? Like, yeah. They're like, how, how many years? I said, like, four, four years, four or five years. They're like, you know what, man? You, you ain't going to be a vegetarian long here. You're going to work. Watch, you going to break name. Once you see how much food they are, they don't feed us that much. Mm-hmm. And you take away the meat. Mm-hmm. But you, so, you know, so once they see that and they see that you're very principled, in which, unfortunately, you know, a lot of brothers in our community, particularly the criminalized ones, they're, they're the brothers, a lot of them lack principle. Mm-hmm. So when, that, when I see other people that have principle, they become curious. Mm-hmm. And interested who you are, what you about, right. you know. Then they hear about your case. Cause initially, when I come in, kind of tell them a little bit about it. Right. You know, they're looking at like that shit don't make sense. They're like, oh, mm-hmm. they came and got you. you okay, you a felon? No, nah, no, nah. you ain't no felon. So why they get you? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, they tried to say that. A charge that I had previously um, that wasn't a assault was a assault charge, and but the thing is, is that the feds they already knew that it was an assault charge, right. but they felt like that they had a loophole, mm-hmm. like a criminal loophole. To be able to say, hey, we can try to forge this and use this as a way to say he don't have, he shouldn't have firearms. You know what I'm saying? Why? Well, I'm special agent Aaron McKeagley, right? With Keegley, Kegley. And I've been following this guy for two years, and even though he have not been doing anything irresponsible and crazy for me to arrest him. I don't like the things that he's been saying on social media. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, based off the things he says on social media that are completely 100% legal, I want him arrested. And, and I'm going to overreach my Ability to get him arrested, and that's what happened. And because you know, when I first got my initial, when I first got my judge, I mean, I'm sorry, my attorney, his name is John Nicholson, I'm a real good attorney, federal attorney, uh, particularly dealing with gun cases. Um, you know, he told me he was like, "Man, I'm surprised any prosecutor would even pick up this case because it's a." Big, big high risk of losing, right. you know, and you know. Okay, became bigger than what they expected. Well, it was due for the people, people like you and other thousands of people who you some way, some shape or form, bring awareness to the situation, mm-hmm. and now you have. Local, a local federal government, right? Mm-hmm. Key word, we have to say local. Oh, exactly. These people are people that's from this area yeah. and things of that nature that lives here. They are amongst the politics here and mm-hmm. engaged into the local politics. And so they have like a local influence and local control. Right. But, you know, when a local federal government, you know, goes after you, you know, it's you. You know, you find out how a federal government is pretty. 
the power that he has is determined and controlled by regular white people. I thought you are. <laughs> <laughs> just, it just broke the <laughs> I've been saying that forever because yeah. it's, it's not to interrupt you. you. You get to understand that, you know what, all this is just based off of white feeling. Like, even if I wasn't, you emotional know, told, reaction. emotional, yeah. based off of your whiteness. It's not even based off of me being a threat to your government, me being a threat to your, your system. Yeah. I'm just trying to enrich my people. Because there are some black people out there who like, you know what, I mean? fuck it, let's get them, you know what I mean? And, right, right, right. And that's a very, very small amount, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and the and that amount don't really get down with the type that's just really on, on the enrichment. But they treat y'all who are only about the enrichment, not hating nobody. Right. They right. treat y'all as if y'all are anti American. They treat right. y'all as if y'all anti American. You, know, you know us historically. I right? know. Yeah, yeah. So, Cause I'm trying to get you on my tip. We were at our conversation, <laughs> and so y'all, yeah, y'all were like, like, legit. Now I'm like, I, I was there. Then it came. To y'all know. <laughs> I was like, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Especially back then. You know, Especially back you then. a little bit right now. You a little bit more. You know, I think you evolved. Yeah. We all evolved. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. Were. Yeah. Were. Yeah. I'll say that back 2012. We was having conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd be in South Dallas hanging out. Yeah. And um, yeah, you, so you know, like we're not some people. Be like, man, we gonna kill white. No, we gonna start killing white men. No, no. 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 Or, or just killing police. Yeah. No, that I ain't, you ain't never heard me have some rhetoric come out of my mouth saying, you know what, man? I'm bored. Let's kill police officers. Never. I ain't never yeah. been on no shit like that. You know what, man? We need to arm up and out of nowhere let's just attack the police. Let's get these motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, that's some cartoon shit. Yeah. That's not, our people are not, our, peop- our people are not prepared to do anything like we would get our people slaughtered. Yeah. yeah. But right now, what we're what we're talking about is our will to live even amongst dealing with fuckery. Thank so you. in other words, yeah. if I'm going about my day in a lawful way, mm. you know, and, and I'm doing something that is not, that has no victim, just because this individual has insecurities mm-hmm. and he's pissed off, mm-hmm. He should not be able to just pull up on me and abuse me, and I cannot even naturally defend myself. Now, that type of fuckery, I am against. And I do support defending yourself against any motherfucking criminal with a badge or without a badge. A motherfucking criminal is a fucking criminal. Because they, 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 just because they got their uniform, don't make them no better than you. Did you hear about that case in Baltimore with uh, these police officers? To my recently, yeah, who yeah. were on that ring and that was with that Freddie Gray. Yeah, when they, when, when they busted all those people who uh, raided pharmacies, mm-hmm. um, they got the the pills and sold them themselves. Mm. The, the, the Baltimore pills. police, yeah. 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 I just I they just all heard got about yeah. yeah. They, looking at about eighteen years one with the green leader. Looking at 18 years. And I'm looking at all the I same dead the people. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, that was me. I would have been looking at easily 60 years. 46 like, easy. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Easy. No, 18? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. But that's, that's, that's how you know it's based off of their cultural perspective. Yeah. And that's one thing. And, that, and that's one of the questions I want to ask you. Having gone through what you've gone through, mm-hmm. followed the channels. Right. Follow the law. Y'all y'all done work as far as working with police officers in the aspect of of like 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 training, Black Panthers. Y'all I mean y'all done demonstrations to where the city has to know what you're doing and you're interacting with some type of city representative and everything. Everything is lawful. Everything's but right. yet it still comes down to how they feel about you. Right. Because, because who you who you are empowering. So exactly. so, so my question is do you feel that us that do do you feel that that kind of takes away from an aspect of of our humanity if ultimately when we follow all these laws that really ain't set in our benefit we still we, we still can't enact even even uh uh second citizen type of humanity with it 
I mean, you, we follow the laws, and they say, no, you follow the laws too well. Yeah. Well, you know, one, if I, you got to understand that, which I know you understand, but just people in general, the masses, they got to understand that there is no thing called rights. Right. right. You know what I'm saying? Correct. There's no such thing. You know, constitutional rights, those are, what those are, are privileges. Mm -hmm. And they only go to certain individuals, yeah. but it's not for everybody. Yeah. So at any moment, a police officer can violate your constitutional right, and it can be justified. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's crazy. Because last time I checked, Police officers are sworn into the Constitution, just like individuals in the military. Exactly. 